All right, welcome back. I'm going to talk to you about the Perseus myth, or myths in this case, since I covered two different versions. Oh, it's been a long day. Anyway, <laughs> um, so Perseus is clearly a hero, right? He goes on a quest. He has a rough time. He faces death quite a few times. He brings back treasure, and he comes back to the world better than ever, right? And so if we look at all of those elements, he's uh, it's pretty amazing, right? So what do we learn from the Perseus myth in particular, right? So Perseus is an almost flawless hero. He is similar in some ways to Odysseus in that he's got a whole lot of great and very little wrong with him, right? He, when you think about him, right, he has tremendous caution most of the time. However, the one time he screws up is the time that he ends up having to go ahead and deal with the consequences of his actions, which happen to launch him on his quest, which makes him a hero. So in some ways, his fault is exactly what makes him heroic as well. If he didn't have this flaw, he never would have become heroic. He never would have said to Polydectes, hey, I can bring you the Medusa's head, or I bring you anything you wish. Bring me Medusa's head. Oh, maybe not that. <laughs> so he has to go off and do it. Now, he is the son of Zeus. This makes him the, you know, the demigod. Now, I know some of you might be familiar with Rick Riordan's reimagining of the Greek pantheon and and the Greek myths, and uh, if you're not, I highly recommend the series. It's very, very fun. I haven't read all of the series, okay? I've read the first series, the first five books, the ones that follow Percy Jackson through his initial adventures. I think he makes appearances and cameos in future series, but I haven't seen those, or read them, I should say. I haven't read those, so I can't really speak to them. However, the first five books are fantastic. And I will say that the more you know about Greek mythology as you're reading those books, you totally appreciate the little twists and turns and added bits and pieces that Rorden adds to it. I, for one, think he's done an amazing job with it. It's fantastic. However, it is not wholly accurate. Like I was Starting to say, those of you who are used to or familiar with Riordan think that, well, I mean, in his myth, the Percy character, Percy Jackson, he is a son of Poseidon, which is a cool twist, but that's not the case in the Perseus myth. In the Perseus myth, he is a son of Zeus. Zeus comes as a golden shower through the hole that's there for Dine to look out and get air and breathe. And he comes and visits her, and then, oops, baby, right? So then we get Perseus, and he is clearly a son of Zeus, not of Poseidon. And it's interesting because when you think about the Perseus myth, and at the thing that's at the heart of it is his quest for Medusa's head, right? And he goes off to get Medusa's head, and Medusa is a love of Poseidon. Now... There are many versions of the myth, and in the versions that I read with you, I did not cover the origin of Medusa herself as a Gorgon. So there are two different, three different schools of thought on this, and the myth has evolved as time has gone by, and in some ways maybe you could even think of Riordan's reimagining as another evolution in Greek mythology, but Let's go back to the beginnings. In the beginnings, the Gorgons are these ugly, round-faced, boar-tusked, monstrous women, but not really uh, showing any of the femininity of the Greek era or our era or any era for that matter. They they are monstrous beasts, right? They're, they're these hulking, monstrous uh, creatures. So anyway, they, uh, the Gorgons 
Initially, there are three of them, and they are sisters, and Medusa is the only mortal one. Later on, as the stories are told and retold and reworked and uh, put into dramas and things, Medusa comes to be almost romanticized, I guess might be the term. She's romanticized as being this beautiful woman who Poseidon falls in love with. He must have her. Of course, this is the way all of these gods and goddesses work. As soon as they fall head over heels for somebody, not have them, right? And so as they go, her, as the story goes, Medusa either resists or doesn't resist his advances, and eventually they find themselves in Athena's temple. And there's an altar, and there's them, and there's not much else, probably no clothing involved. You get the idea, right? So Athena, a virgin goddess, is furious about this because one it's happening and two it's happening in her temple and three it's happening with her uncle who she cannot stand so and that goes way back to a grudge with athens the city was not athens yet and there was going to be a competition for who was going to have the city named after them poseidon gave them a saltwater spring and athena gave them olives and an olive tree so Hmm. It's way, uh, which one's better there? Water we cannot drink, or something that provides us with sustenance and building material. So, you can, and we know how it ends up and shakes out because the city is called not Poseidonville, but Athens, right? So, anyway, when we consider the Perseus myth, Let's get back to the heart of the matter, right? Which is that Perseus uh, goes off to kill Medusa. And whether or not she's a romanticized image and this creature who... Athena makes her into the creature. I'm sorry, I didn't finish the story. How terrible of me. Anyway, I'm not editing this either. So you're just going to have to deal with this stuff. I'm not editing it. I have done enough editing today. You're getting the live lecture on Perseus. So anyway, Athena gets a hold of Medusa and curses her. She turns her beautiful hair into coiling snakes, warps and twists her face, gives her these bronze feet and these bronze wings, and she becomes a gorgon, and she freaks out wakes up, rose to run her hand through, has snakes, her hands are bitten, she's looking at everything, she's hideous, and she flies off, and she ends up in the same island where the other two Gorgons, who are immortal, are hanging out. And so they become sisters. Or, it's just a way to make the earlier myth work with the newer version of the myth. Regardless, Perseus then goes journeying off there. Now, he does get help from the gods. That is a key element. Being helped by the gods does not make you not heroic. As a matter of fact, it makes you more of a hero. If the gods don't help or care for you, you don't matter. And you're not a hero. It's not something that you have to do everything on your own. So I think it's important to remember that you don't just do everything on your own when you're a hero. You have to have help, right? So... Perseus goes off, he gets the help from Hermes, he gets help from Athena, no surprise there, and he goes on his quest, he runs into the gray eye, these three weird gray sisters who are sisters of the Gorgons, because all monstrous creatures are related. And there's more of that you find in another myth that I'll talk about later on, which is uh, talks about like the mother of all monsters and the father of most monsters, which would be uh, Typhon and Echidna. And they have lots of monstrous children. All of the most famous monsters come from the union of those two. So, but we'll talk about that on another, another lecture, another day. Right now, we'll try to desperately try to focus on Perseus. So Perseus meets the gray eye and he tricks them, right? Hermes brings him there. With the help of Hermes, however, when he's there, Perseus uses his own 
powers of the mind, his own quick thinking, to outwit them, steal their tooth in their eye, and then demand that they tell him how to get the rest of the way to Medusa, how to defeat her, how what, what to do, right? And so we see Perseus use his mind, right? He's not just a brawny beast of a man like, say, Heracles is. Heracles is a great hero, don't get me wrong. However, he's not known for using his brains over his brawn, right? He's really more of a guy who is brawn. Ugh. Right? I mean, come on. The guy hits his music teacher over the head and kills him by accident? That's not intelligent. Just saying. Please don't kill me, Heracles. Anyway, so Perseus uses his mind, tricks the gray eye, gets the rest of the materials he needs, uh, visits the Hesperides, gets the gifts, or given the gifts by the gods, depends on from whom or where we're going, or what help, or how much help. Then he goes off to the island of the Gorgons, uses the, the mirror and, and the shield, and sees the reflection, and can't believe how ugly they are, and sneaks up, totally invisible. Hey, who knows? Um, Hades, Helmet of Invisibility, always cool for mortals, always disappointing for gods. Anyway, he slices off her head with the adamantine sword. Is, a, is that maybe where adamantium came from, if for you Wolverine fans out there? Anyway, he slices off the head with the adamantine sword and puts it into the bag, the wallet, the sack, whatever it is, the magical thing that it doesn't burn through, and out of the corpse pop two creatures, right? And the most famous and enduring of them all is Pegasus, the winged horse. And Pegasus leaps out and in some version snorts, and then the uh, other two Gorgons wake up. Uh, and, oh, excuse me, Perseus takes off. He's out of there. And he's got the invisibility cap on, so good luck catching him. And he's got the winged sandals, so he's flying out, right? <laughs> so he takes off. Goodbye. And he's got the Medusa's head in the bag. Now, I put some video clips in my readings of the next part, which is pretty interesting, because he comes to uh, the shores around Ethiopia, and where Cassiopeia and her uh, husband are dealing with the fallout of her bragging, or she's like, oh, I'm so much more beautiful than the gods themselves. Again, hubris, right? Hubris is a problem. And it's a problem that Perseus does not have. He does not possess a false sense of confidence. He does not possess a false sense of pride. He's not a tragic hero. He's not a hero who suffers from the typical downfall. And as a result, you'll notice that he does not have a fall, and is rather, he ascends to the heavens at the end and is a constellation, right? And I know I made a joke about it being a constellation or constellation prize, but it's actually a pretty grand honor. This is not something that's afforded to, well, losers, right? It's not something that's afforded to non-heroic types. Ooh. Anyway, as Perseus continues his journey, he sees Andromeda chained to the rocks, and she's like a statue. She's so beautiful. He's got to rescue her. There's no one here to save her. There's a sea monster coming. They call it the Kraken. And I know in the I put clips from the, both movies called Clash of the Titans. Fun movies, by the way. Uh, the older one, actually way better than the new one. The new one's got this weird anti-gods vibe going through, which just doesn't make any sense for anybody who has any sense of how the mythology works. But if you want to make a brand new story or you want to try and sh shake things up a lot, I guess that's a way to do it. I don't think it's very effective, though. And there's a really ridiculous part in the film. If you watch it, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's ridiculous. It almost ruins the whole movie. As a matter of fact, for me, it pretty much killed it. Anyway, the old version, the 1981 version, is fantastic. There's really cool stuff in it. I highly recommend it. Maybe I'll try to get it up on the Google Classroom for you. Anyway, 
the the rescuing of Andromeda is almost like a uh, hostage negotiation in a sense. He's like, hey, listen, uh, if you let me marry her, I'll save her. <laughs> like, what is that? But he is uh, smitten by her, and he really believes that he can easily save her. It's not, not an issue. And in the film versions, you'll see there's a very different method of dispatching the Kraken. And in this one, he just dives right in and hacks it up, and the whole sea is incarnadine, right, to use a Shakespearean word that you won't hear anywhere else except Macbeth, uh, in, you know, in all the great sea is incarnate. It's turned red. And as we get uh, sort of some of these more origin pieces of the myth in there about how this is the start of the Red Sea, which is pretty neat. I mean, it's kind of a cool origin myth dropped into the middle of the Perseus myth. And so anyway, he goes ahead, he defeats all some more enemies, some more people, turns them to stone with Medusa's head all of which is him just trying to get back home. He's got a wife with him now. He's got, you know, the, which is like the ultimate gift, right? And then he goes off to rescue his mother, holds the head up, turns everybody to stone. They're all done. Gives everything back to the gods and goddesses. He doesn't try to hoard power for himself or keep everything. He gives back whatever he's borrowed he returns, right? So that's a piece that makes Perseus also unique and sort of interesting as a hero because he doesn't just take power, crave power, try to get everything. As a matter of fact, he freely gives things away. He doesn't really want to be king of Argos, and eventually he doesn't. He decides not to be when he accidentally kills the former king of Argos, Acrisius, his grandfather, when he goes and tosses a discus, because everyone's like, oh, you're such a great athlete. And he's like, yeah, okay, I'll throw it for you. I'll put it on a show. And he goes off and tosses the discus, and then it veers off and right in the back of the head of the old man who's running away. And that old man running away was his grandfather. So even though he's Perseus the ill-fated, he doesn't do anything horribly wrong. Yes, he kills his grandfather, but nobody's putting him at fault for that. And the fact that he was willing to forgive and wanted to visit his grandfather is remarkable, considering what his grandfather did to him in the very beginning, tossing him into a casket, essentially, and launching him into the sea and saying, if he dies, it's not my fault, right? And <laughs> drives you nuts, doesn't it? Anyway. I think that sort of wraps up everything I wanted to say about Perseus. He's a great hero, interesting character, does good things, meets all of the qualities of the uh, Joseph Campbell's concept of the uh, hero. And I hope this lecture has been of some help to you. I hope. And uh, yeah, that's it. I'm signing off. And if you haven't watched the two videos where I read Perseus to you might want to do that because this whole thing might make a little more sense. Have a good day. Or day, I guess.